G'day legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day and that you've had a good weekend. Now I did miss yesterday's video, so we do have a little bit to talk about. So today, we're going to talk about some fighter jets going down, a Nord Stream story released by some German newspapers titled All Evidence Points to Kiev. And then of course we're going to have a look over the maps. Now, as I'm sure everyone has heard about, two L-39 fighter jet trainers have collided, killing three Ukrainian pilots. This happened in the Zotomir region, about 150 kilometers or 90 miles west of Kiev. Now, let's have a look over some of this. Now, this happened as well on Aviation Day in Ukraine. Now, notably, one of the pilots who was in this incident, who went down, was named Juice, or at least call sign Juice. And Juice was really on the forefront of pushing for Western jets to come into Ukraine. So here we have this video here. So, of course, in the end here, showing an F-15. We know F-15s are not going to Ukraine as they're not being exported that way, but instead they're getting then the F-15. Sixteen. Now we have some photographs of this as well. So this is where the crash site is in that oblast. So as you can see, very little left remaining off the plane there. And Zelensky has then released he, this video the upon his Twitter. Пілоти, інженери, всі, хто в авіагалузі, в авіавиробництві, в авіатранспорті. Всі, хто робить Україну однією з міцних країн. Бо справжня міцність є лише у тих держав, які вміють захищати власне небо, шанують власну авіацію. Зараз цього року Україна має зробити всю необхідну роботу, щоб у нашому небі з'явились F-16, і це стане новим рівнем української військової авіації. І це наблизить повернення цивільної авіації в українське небо, бо наблизить перемогою дасть Україні більше безпеки. Є із чим привітати у цей день авіації, є за що подякувати, я вдячний, ми всі вдячні. Але на жаль, сьогодні, сьогодні тільки таких слів недостатньо. Вчора у небі над Житомирщиною сталася катастрофа, двоє льотчиків загинули. So Zelensky, of course, talking about the importance of the aviation in Ukraine, the importance of modern fighters coming in, and then speaking of the disaster that happened where two planes have collided midair and gone down. So pro-Ukrainian accounts were very quickly to point at how this could have been avoided with modern Western airframes. And pro-Russian accounts have pointed at the lack of training, and the incompetence of pilots. And I'll just say that it was neither of these. Both sides are just wrong. I've seen people attacking that it's directly Biden and the West's fault because if they had modern fighters, this wouldn't have happened. And if it was training, whatever, then you know this wouldn't have happened on the other side. And both are wrong. Like, have we forgotten what fighter jets do? Like, fighter jets fly at well above sometimes the speed of sound. You know, Mark II, fucking very bloody fuck. These crashes, accidents happen on the road. These are going incredibly fast. Any wrong move, any little mistake, any anything, and everything is going bad very quickly. Accidents happen. Only on Friday, an F-18 Delta went down in San Diego. So, so the US, with the best training and the best planes in the world. What I think you need to really do is you need to compare Formula 1 Sorry, you need to compare pilots to like Formula One MotoGP. That is the sort of level these people are performing. And at that high level, mistakes then happen. Would have Western F-16s stopped this accident happening? Happening? No. Would more training, everything there happen? These guys have been flying combat missions for months and months in the most demanding environment. We have then seen modern fighter aircraft ever enter. So 
take that as you will, but I believe that both sides are commenting on that. On is it directly Biden's fault? Is it directly this? No, accidents just happen. But sadly, three pilots did lose their lives, and planes are replaceable. Pilots are not, and especially very experienced pilots like Juice. Juice rose to a lot of like internet fame and notoriety through these sort of videos on his Twitter talking then about getting Western fighter jets and was, you know, a lot of people even compared with the sort of ghost of Kiev sort of bloody thing. But either way, losing pilots, experienced guys, is a massive hit. There is not that many pilots in any country, except maybe America, but any country. There's tens, maybe hundreds in any country. So losing experienced pilots is a big hit. And of course, these experienced guys, these are going to be the way more faster to pick up the F-16 program training than other uh, pilot, other newer pilots then would be. So it is a big problem there. So this is a bigger loss than I think some people are actually saying. So the next thing I want to do is look at sort of some of the power of geolocation. Now, I can't show you uh, the full bits of these videos, but they'll be on my Telegram, so go and have a look there. So I just wanted to have like a quick peer over these videos because today these two videos from Klishkivka, which is just to uh, the south of Bakhmut, there's a lot of fighting there. We'll talk about the maps in a second. These videos have come from there only, well, it is talked about today. At least that's what I'm uh, seeing online. So... This then is a Russian sniper in then this building and he's around and then, you know, takes a few shots out from there. And as well, this is the Ukrainian said to be uh, the Safari Assault Regiment here doing some fighting in around here as well. And I can't definitely can't show you anything in this. Now, the geolocation guys have just done this is where then the sniper was and they've taken bits and pieces from here and this all lines up with the blue the yellow like it's color coordinated to the other map now with all of this like with everything in this war take it with a grain of salt a lot of people get stuck in here about you don't believe anyone i think in reporting this like the job i do that it needs to be where you come at it from that you like well, i want hard evidence for what's what but Again, color coordinated to these photographs from then uh, the GoPro of exactly where these are. And then they gave, of course, a geo location to where exactly these are. So what I want to talk about is this firstly, this is the exact location apparently that then the Russian sniper was. And then I've gone on to the Kshkivka map and I've put in both of these geolocations here. This is, of course, where the Ukrainian regiment was. This is where the Russian regiment is now. So, what, well, 600 metres to walk, but as the crow flies, much, much less than that. And that just shows how close this fighting actually is. Now, these roads don't line up perfectly on this map, but you can see that the red zone here is where the Russian sniper was, and somewhere about here is where then that other regiment is working. And that just shows you how close all this fighting is happening, and that is then well within rifle range there. And the power of geolocation, how that is going to move forward into war on just online and how dangerous that actually can be for some fucking knob it's like a house down my street that just has like the biggest shit box cars and they just like fang them around <laughs> it's, it's, yeah <laughs> they're knobs but anyway fuck he's still going for it anyway you can just see how quickly people can geolocate things and the closeness of then the fighting then we'll go over the maps a little bit further on as well so something i did want to talk about too Grey Zone, who is a Telegram channel of Wagner PMC, has confirmed that Bieber has been killed. Now, who is that? Well, Dolik, Brigosian, and Bieber here. Now, this is off another page of War Zone, but then we'll show it. Look, Grey Zone. Trouble does not come alone, friends. Unfortunately, the exact news recently came that legendary Bieber died near Bakhmut three weeks ago. I wanted to write this even when the rumor started, but I do not have unverified information. And then it came from the official then Grey Zone. One of the two fighters of the Wagner group who became known as a result of a video with Yevgeny Prokosian died in a battle while repelling an enemy attack near Bakhmut. On May 25th, 2023, a video appeared where Yevgeny Prokosian says that he was leaving two fighters, Biba and Dolik, to help the Russian army. They become heroes of good jokes and memes, thereby demonstrating that in order to participate in such large-scale battles as the battle for Bakhmut, it is not necessary to have appearance of Hollywood action movies. Unfortunately, one of them died in battle a few weeks ago near Puckwood. The fighter with call sign Biba, who is on the right, on the left of the video in the frame, was the commander of the assault squad of the Wagner group, had internal awards such as trench cross 
and the medal for participation in the Bakhmut meat grinder. Bebop was an old and experienced fighter, a simple Russian peasant who had gone through the war in Chechnya in past and took part in the storming of Grozny. So, of course, we're talking about Chechnya, Grozny. That is some heavy experience there from Biba, who has been killed in Bakhmut. And I know, personally, has been the butt of many jokes and memes as well that have come about. Now, continuing to speak then on Wagner PMC, Wagner has been in the news for all the wrong reasons, of course, with Yevgeny Prigozhin taken out through the week and fingers being pointed bloody everywhere. And I think we all probably know what most likely then happened. But a video has come out where this guy is in front of then Wagner Graves not knowing what well, has happened to them. So, this obelisk was opened by Yevgeny Prigozhin. We will watch this video, but then this is an old video of the late Prigozhin in front of then the same obelisk at uh, the graveyard for the Wagner PMC fires. Вот здесь вот были сами могилы вагнеровцев. Вот они были вдоль. вдоль. Николаевское кладбище. Здесь непонятно, что происходит. Все венки тресты взяли, собрали. Здесь непонятно, что делают. Вот здесь были могилы. Вот здесь сейчас вот щебень лежит. Вот здесь лежали могилы, потому что вот там Пригожина открывал обелиск. Все. A lot of people and, you know, Ukrainian accounts have said that this is basically just getting rid of Wagner and an official Ukrainian account journalist blogger saying this, Wagner is being purged from Russian history. The graves of Progos war criminals are being wiped away with a screenshot then of the video. But I have seen a lot of suggestions that this is just a new memorial being built and that it might be then replaced with these pyramids, which we have seen before, which of course represent, resemble, what am I talking about, then resemble the tank traps we have seen across Ukraine as well, that Russia has been laying, that it's just moving some stuff to then make a greater memorial there. But either way, being from a military background, I think then there should be a lot of respect for the dead. With your enemy, of course, hate your enemy, fight them like hell, kill them if needed in a war scenario. But when someone's dead, they're dead, they're not a threat. And I wouldn't agree with any... Um, burial site for anyone being uh, taken away. Now, I have respect for all of those who fight on the uh, value of actually just being a warrior, signing up to volunteer for fight to what you believe in. Now, uh, is there right and wrong? Yes, of course there is in all wars, especially as we move further away from a lot of wars. But this, you got to remember that either side of this, these are still people's kids, there's still someone's loved one, somewhere for them to visit. And this is why I'm not a big fan of ripping down uh, memorial statues, things like this, that even if we don't agree with that anymore, and even if everyone in society says that is not fucking us anymore, that I think it's still part then of history. And I wouldn't agree with any um, site like that then actually being pulled down. But as we know, well, we don't really know what is going on there, but you know, Wagner Group isn't in the best light with the Kremlin currently. There's a lot of reports going around that Wagner fighters are being made to like pledge allegiance to the Russian Ministry of Defence as well. Now, the, one of the last things I want to talk about is this very interesting article has come out from a German newspaper as well about what happened to the Nord Stream pipeline. Now, I know a lot of this may be a bit of a no shit, but we're going to go over it anyway. And if you'd like to read the full thing, because it is very long, uh, I will link that below as well. So some of the very interesting bits in this, and I will point out is it was 80 meters down and that they have found something called octogen, which, in, which is an explosive that then works underwater as well. So let's go over this. And the reason I bring up, sorry, why uh, 80 metres down is employment and 
important and an octogen um, explosive like that is that is just isn't shit that like you and I can do. Anyone who's like any recreational diver, you know, your limit might be 18 or 30 meters depending on if you're advanced or uh, just normal open water diving. Anything really below that, that is getting into very specialized things, especially then laying explosives at 80 meters, th- shit like that. That is very high commercial military style diving. So this is some level of team. Like this isn't just some random dude out there. So let's go over then this. So uh, German Spiegel newspaper, all the evidence points to Kiev and talks about it's a spy thriller that has the potential to change the course of international politics. A year ago, a secret commando blew up the Nord Stream pipelines in the Baltic Sea. Since then, investigators have been searching for the perpetrators. The leads they have found are extremely politically sensitive. So, uh, no, this isn't, of course, the full article. I've just been pulling bits out that I think is important to this. This is the most important investigation of Germany's post-war history because of its potential political implications. Says a senior security official. Those within Federal Criminal Police uh, Office, the BKA, are responsible for the Nord Stream case. Members of the department, ST24, are even prohibited from discussing it with colleagues who aren't part of the probe. Investigators are required to document when and with whom they spoke about which aspect of the case, a requirement that is extremely unusual, even the BKA, Germany's equivalent to the FBI. There is a lot at stake. That much is clear. If it was a Russian commando, would it be considered an act of war? According to Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty, of course, being NATO, an attack on the critical infrastructure of a NATO member state can trigger the mutual defence clause. If it was Ukraine, would that put an end to Germany's ongoing support for the country with tank deliveries and potentially even fighter jets? And what about the Americans? If Washington provided assistance for the attack, might that spell the end of the 75-year trans-Atlantic partnership? Well, Behind the scenes, though, you get clearer statements. Investigators from the BKA, the Federal Police and the Office of the Federal Prosecutor have few remaining doubts that a Ukrainian commando was responsible for blowing up the pipelines. A striking number of clues point to Ukraine, they say. They say with Valery K IP addresses, have emails and phone calls, location data and numerous other even clearer clues that have been kept secret so far. One top official says that far more is known than has been stated publicly, according to the DER or Der Spiegel's. So, so according to the Der Spiegel sources, of course, this is the paper. Investigators are certain that the saboteurs were in Ukraine before and after the attack. Indeed, the overall picture formed by the puzzle pieces of technical information has grown quite clear, and the possible motives seem clear to intentional security circles. The aim, they say, was to deprive Moscow of an important source of revenue for financing the war against Ukraine and at the same time deprive Putin once and for all of his most important instrument of blackmail against the German government. But cr- but crucial questions remain unanswered. From how high up was the attack ordered and who knew about it? Was it an intelligence operation that the political leadership of Kiev learned about only later? Or was it a product of a commando unit acting on its own? Or was it a military operation in which the Ukrainian general staff was involved? Intelligence experts and security policy experts, however, considered unlikely that Ukrainian President Zelensky was in on it. In the case of sabotage, the political leadership is often deliberately kept in the dark so that they can plausibly deny any knowledge later on. In early June, when the first indication of Kiev's possible involvement came to light, Zelensky strongly denied it. I'm the president and I give the orders accordingly, he said. Nothing of the sort has been done by Ukraine. I would never act in such a manner. Of course, if it was found out there, that could have a lot of implications further down the line for support for Ukraine from Germany, who we know is very important with Rain Metal, uh, of course, for the tanks and then a lot of ammunition as well. The warnings. Perhaps the attack could have been prevented in the first place. It doesn't come as a complete surprise after all that it has been announced several months beforehand in detail. But the warning wasn't taken seriously enough at the right places. An encrypted, strictly confidential dispatch from an allied intelligence agency was received by this, the BND, Germany's foreign intelligence agency, in June 22. Such dispatches are hardly an anomaly, but this one contained a clear warning. It was from the Netherlands Military Intelligence Agency, which goes by the initials MIVD and is well known for its expertise in Russian cyber warfare techniques. On this occasion, though, the agency's alarming information seemed to have come from a human asset in Kiev. The Dutch also informed the CIA 
just to be on the safe side and also forward it onto the Germans. The confidential dispatch sketched out an attack on the Nord Stream pipelines. The plan called for six commando soldiers from Ukraine concealed with fake identities to charter a boat, dive down to the bottom of the Baltic Sea with specialised equipment and blow up the pipes. According to the information, the men were under the command of Ukrainian commander-in-chief Valery Zhuluzhny. But President Volodymyr Zelensky had apparently not been informed of the plan. The attack was apparently planned to take place during the NATO exercise Boltops on the Baltic Sea. The content of the secret dispatch was originally reported by the Washington Post in early June. The BND forwarded the warning to the Chancellery at the German government headquarters. It was deemed irrelevant. After all, it only arrived at the Chancellery after the NATO manoeuvre had come to an end and nothing had happened. That is why nobody sounded the alarm, says one of the few people who learned of the warning when I arrived. Most German security officials believe the information contained in the dispatch was inaccurate. As a result, no protective measures were introduced, no further investigations were undertaken, and no preparations were made to potentially prevent an attack at a later point in time. The Federal Police, the German Navy and the anti-terrorism centres never even learned of the warning, nor did the German agency responsible for the oversight of of the Nord Stream. So the boat which was chartered, they took police dogs on and quote, on a table below decks and even on the toilet, they were able to find a substantial traces of oxygen, an explosive that only works underwater. So as we know, this is no amateur team. But what else could be the possibility here? Well, they talk about this here. The next theory, somewhat more widespread, even among Berlin politicians, goes like this. Russia destroyed the pipelines with the aim of later blaming it on the Ukrainians in a way that could undermine Western support for Kyiv. The Andromeda, of course, then the boat, and all the evidence pointing to Ukraine was planted by the Russian agents, they say, to throw the Europeans off the scent. The theory that is a false flag operation performed by the Russians is considerably probable by rhetoric Coswater, the security and defence policy point man for the centre-right Christian Democrats in the Bundestag. Coswater says it would totally fit with Russia's style to pull off an operation like that perfectly and make it look like the trail leads to Kiev. Now, furthermore, conversely, many other intelligence experts consider it highly improbable that Russian agents, who have a show of predilection in recent years of more rustic methods, have brazen and easily exposed political assassinations, could execute such a complex deception manoeuvre flawlessly. So putting doubt in, could Russia actually undertake this with the amount of like um, evidence put that there's no real question around that it was Ukraine? Like, how could they do this so well, knowing there's been... been like open brazen attacks. Look at like you've getting Prigozhin. Like a oh, fucking plane just blew up. And look at uh, their poisonings, things like this. German federal prosecutor Otte uh, emphasised that the Bundestag Internal Affairs Committee that they were definitely considering the working hypothesis that state-directed perpetrators from Russia could be responsible. Of course, we are following up on those leads as well, but we don't have any evidence or confirmation of that so far. So talking about that, then it was then this false flag attack. So this is a very interesting article to then go through. Now, at the end of the day, what I do is I report on the media and give my own bit in this. So did Russia take this out or not? Personally, I don't believe that it's in Russia's favour to have taken this out. And I sort of agree with the um, some of the comments there that with how Russia is brazenly with these attacks, would have they been able to plan and do this so perfectly like this to stitch up another country? But some of the things left behind were fucking very suspicious as well, that you think a crack team wouldn't have had um, things written down, leaving things on the bottom, things like this. But at the end of the day, we don't really know. We don't have a smoking gun who did it, but this article is very interesting and puts forward, even if a lot of people, including you know myself, may have made up their mind on who they think was then responsible for this. Now, what we're going to do is have a look over the maps and see what has changed. Of course, we have Ukraine in the centre, the capital of Kiev. The red areas uh, areas occupied since 22, the purple since 14. And some people say I'm wrong on the colours here. Maybe I'm just fucking colourblind as well. So let's actually have a look at where we're talking about. So this is the Baltic Sea. This is where we're talking about that. These pipelines came through from Russia in the Baltic Sea. And of course, this is the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov to get ahead around some areas here. And of course, this is the Zotomir uh, Oblast where these two planes went down, killing then the three pilots. So there has been a lot of shifting on the deep state map, but I think this is just correcting border outlines. Uh, I've had some people ask me about this. So if we go back a couple of days, we see like this and it all shifts all down here. But I think all this is doing is then just correcting then that in there. So that's not 
Russia making grand, Russia losing ground, Ukraine make it's none of that. It's just the correcting the coastline from there. Now we haven't seen any movement up around Lobkovi. We haven't seen any movement in here for then a long time. As we can see, this green means that it's older than two weeks. If it was blue, it's less than two weeks on this map. And this front here, I'm sure there's still a lot of fighting going on here, but we're just not hearing anything about that. As one of the spots we did see Ukraine push very early on on this, maybe they hit a lot of defense and moved into another spot. Now where everyone's just talking about over the past week is, of course, then Robert Tinney. So, of course, this green, this is where the counteroffensive has started. So, I've cleared this far in. Now, let's roll back to then the 24th, where I last spoke to you, and then let's skip to the 25th, 26th, and then to today. So, as you can see, Ukraine making more and more ground and taking positions in these initial lines of defence as well. So, starting right on these, taking up new positions and making more significant gains through there. So, then let's have a look then on the daily Ukraine map update and in the West doesn't show any change either. So let's have a look as you can see making the same sort of gains to the east here of uh, Novoporivka east to the south and to the direct east as well. So pushing down in the same areas we have seen. Now this uh, town down here. This has not fallen like some people did uh, report maybe three days ago, but Robertini is under complete control of the Ukrainian forces there, although there are said to be a number of counterattacks moving back in there. Now, the ISW as well has released this. So you can see here where Robertini is, claimed Russian control to the north then of Robertini, but you can see that this push down to the south, basically in line with Novoforivka here as well, which We'll see where this road is in line with it, showing very similar, but does show you. Uh, sorry, Russia does control more that Ukraine is just making this ground here as well. And as we know, ISW relies on a lot of uh, geolocated information, so sometimes can lag behind some more speculative type maps here as well. But as we know, a lot of ground being taken there. Now, we don't have a uh, Syriac maps today, but then what we do have is then uh, the Rybar Russian sources. So I have two maps here, so the 26th of August and then the 25th of August. So let's put these like this. Now, what it is showing is a lot of ground made then on the east and a movement down to the south. Now, it does definitely not show that it's in line with Novoporivka here like then the other maps are showing, but does show this push into the centre of Robertini as well as clearing a lot of ground on the direct east of Robertini as well. And let's look then at what Rybar says specifically about this. LinkedIn, bloody notification, I'm lucky. Um, in Robertino, the assault units of the 47th Mechanized Brigade of the AFU, the Armed Forces of Ukraine, again transferred to the front line, are trying to completely capture the village. The fighting is still ongoing on the southern outskirts where the infantry groups are thrown by the AFU, but artillerymen work out on them. The enemy's original plan to establish control by Independence Day was thwarted. At the same time, on the ZAP front, reports that losses as a result of such meat assaults have reached quite significant numbers. Despite the activity in Robertino, the most intense battles took place near Vobove, where, reg where detachments of 82 Air Assault Brigade and 46 Mobile Brigades tried to use numerical super superiority. Paratroopers used the standard tactic first, artillery destroy strongholds on the ground, and then infantry detachments break through there. So talking about Vobove, of course, being over here. So the push then to the east. Now, of course, Raba is very Russian source, but it tends to make sense with here. They're not pushing through south through Robertini or making ground, but they are pushing very heavily into the uh, east to Vobove. So that tends to line up there. And this is why we use multiple sources to go over this. Now, the Telegraph has reported, and uh, every paper has picked this up, about reaching them through the hardest lines that break through the toughest Russian lines. And let's look over then this article. Uh, Ukrainian forces have broken through the most difficult line of Russian defences in the south and should be able to advance more quickly now. We don't stop here. The commander who has led some troops in the Robertini told Reuters. Uh, Kiev on Wednesday and its troops have raised the national flag in the settlement of Robertini. We talked about this. It's geolocated in the south Zap region about six miles south of the Oroki front line. Next, we have Berdyansk, and then more. I made it clear to my fighters at once, our goal is not Robertini. Our goal is the Sea of Azov. We have passed <coughs> We have passed the main roads that were mined. We're coming to those lines where we can go forward. I'm sure that we'll go faster from down there. 
So that is from Commander Scala. So saying they've gone through the areas that were heavily mined and that these will then speed up from there and that then Bodiansk was where they're trying to go. Of course, Bodiansk is down here. So let's look at, can we do... Fun, somewhat fucked that up, but let's just do about a hundred kilometers from there. But that it will start speeding up as we as they've gone through the most heavily mined areas. But as we know, getting through here, gaining this foothold in Tokmark, this village here is going to be a hell of a fight. And as the weather will degrade further on, how will that continue looking then through the winter months? Will be very, very interesting. And we know it's still a heavily defended area. If we zoom out here, you can see the scale of what is to come as well. Now, where we are just going to look is up into then Uruzani. Now, there was a lot of pushing here about a week ago, and it's tend to slow down. So there hasn't been much movement. We did see that Uruzani did fall into Russia's control and was moved through very quickly, but of course haven't reached the initial line of defences yet here. But we do have then this from the Rybar Russian sources. Now, the Ukraine map update doesn't show any change here either, but does show, of course, then Uruzani that Ukraine is making more pushes near Lavadny as well. So, of course, Lavadny is over here under Ukrainian control for more than two weeks. Now, let's see then what specifically... Uh, Rybar says then about this, in the vicinity of Ruzani, detachments from the 37th Marine Corps of the Ukrainian Navy tried to dislodge Russian troops from the forest belt east of the village. First, uh, the Marines attacked on foot in groups and then a support of two AFVs. The DV Warrior reports their attempts were then thwarted. The west of Zarmovi, the armed forces of Ukraine, continue to transfer reinforcements to the landing area along the line of contact which is currently arriving. Tanks of the 1st Tank Brigade of the strongholds of the Russian armed forces preparing the ground for the offensive. So saying that they're getting ready for more offensive in and around the Starmorsky region. In addition, the enemy transferred additional territorial defence units to Lovadny as part of the reinforcement of the grouping in the direction of Purutini and in the forest belt of this, I can't pronounce, sorry, paratroopers of the 79th Aerosol Brigade were stationed, whom were partially transferred from this site to then Matyinka. If you look at where the AFU are concentrating reserves, it seems that the strike will be concentrated on strongholds west of Starmorsky. This is quite logical since the positions are on the hill and control over them is necessary to break through to the Sea of Azov. So some interesting updates from there, but we need to remember this is one-sided then as well. So on the Deep State map, there's only a few other small changes. So in and around Klishkivka, we just see this small advance there right in the centre of Klishkivka where we spoke about where that geolocated footage was from. Now we have this here. A geolocated footage on August 26th indicates Ukrainian forces advanced into central Klishkivka, showing some more of that as well. And we spoke about this push up to the north here as well the other day. So that is all that's really been showing there. Then if we move up to the north uh, east, we can't seriously see any changes up here, but we will speak about that one up there in a second. It does show geolocated footage indicates Russian forces advanced west of Kovalivka as of August the 25th. So, of course, west then of Svatov. We have seen some movements in there, but the Deep State hasn't really been keeping up with it. Daily map update did show a lot of changes around there. But that ends our other maps for today. But what we do have is we know... Surek maps and some other uh, Russian sources are claiming Russia is making a lot more ground towards Kupiansk than the other maps are showing. Now, daily uh, map update doesn't show this advance, but we do see this Russian advance through here. So we just want to measure how far this actually is to get an idea. About two kilometres up to there. So is a major push through there of this, but it is just, according to myself, just open ground here. I don't know why if anyone isn't working, it is just not working on deep state at all to get satellite up here. But as we know, some ground is more important than others, but Kupiansk is a massive hub uh, for Ukraine in this region as well. And Russia are pushing very hard here, in, and as I believe too, to try and draw forces from the assaults on the south up into these regions for a defence. So Russia's offensive in those areas can then continue. But legends, that is it for today. I hope you've had a great weekend. I hope you're looking after yourself and I hope you enjoyed this. If you'd like to support me, there's links down below, but never, ever feel obliged. Thank you very much. I'll speak to you soon. Okay, bye-bye.